Possibility. I first heard of this word back in elementary school when I was reading a book called The Art of Possibility. Now, back then, I admit, I bought the book because I thought it sounded cool. But over time, I realized that there's a deeper meaning to these 11 letters. My name is Michael Ko, and I'm currently a fifth year engineering physics student at the University of British Columbia. I'm here today to share about my journey growing up within a disability family the power of possibility, and how it's changed my perspective in overcoming challenges. I have an elder brother named Daniel who is seven years older than me. As far back as I can remember in my toddler days, Daniel's always been this figure of love and genuine care. When we were younger, we spent a lot of time doing random things like playing video games, exploring the outside world, more like our backyard and sharing our common passion of eating good food. Needless to say, Daniel and I grew up quite close together as brothers. Daniel's always been there for me at every step of my journey too. This photo was taken at my high school graduation. A lot of things have changed since the previous photo. I think that Daniel's fashion sense has definitely improved over time. But you can also see that he's in a wheelchair. My brother has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is a disease that progressively weakens the muscles in a person's body over time. He used to be able to walk, move his arms, but over time, he lost that functionality. We first discovered Daniel had muscular dystrophy when he was just nine years old, as he had trouble walking to school on his own. And ever since then, he's needed a wheelchair to get from point A to point B, and takes it with him wherever he goes. Regardless of his condition, however, Daniel and I still found ways to enjoy everyday life. I, for one, got rides on the back of his wheelchair all the time. Now, on the wheelchair, there's a multitude of speed settings you can choose from, ranging from a nice, slow indoor speed to levels that you probably shouldn't be on the back of the wheelchair. But of course, Daniel and I went through all those levels. I think at one point, we even discovered the art of drifting an electric wheelchair. And this was how we lived life day by day, by finding happiness in the small and silly things. However, as time went on, I could slowly see the effects of muscular dystrophy on my brother's body. He started needing help with daily things like eating, sleeping, turning, going to the washroom, Things that we wouldn't think twice about. But for Daniel, these were just some of the many things that he wasn't able to do on his own anymore. And growing up beside a brother with a disability, it honestly was very challenging. When I began to first understand about Daniel's condition, about what muscular dystrophy actually was, it was difficult for me to accept it. And I think I tried really hard to run away from the truth in front of my eyes. But no matter how far I ran, no matter how fast I ran, reality eventually caught up with me. In the summer of 2017, due to his weakened condition, Daniel had a sudden cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest is when a person's heartbeat becomes irregular, and the heart is unable to pump blood to vital organs like the brain. It came as a surprise to us, probably because we weren't expecting it at that time. The paramedics came, Daniel was rushed to the hospital, and I remember riding in that ambulance with him, feeling an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. When we arrived at the hospital, Daniel was immediately taken to the emergency room, and I remember waiting outside. If you've ever been to a hospital, it just seems that hours go by like minutes. Minutes seem to go by like seconds. It's as if someone pressed the fast-forward button on my life. Thankfully, Daniel was stabilized, but he had to remain in the hospital for the next couple of months. And so, I stayed there every day with him. A couple of days later, Daniel and I celebrated my birthday together, 
by connecting my computer to a big TV screen in this hospital unit and doing what else but watching Korean dramas all day. It was at that moment that I realized that the greatest gift we have in our lives is being able to spend time with those who matter to us the most. The flow of time is something that we can't control, but we can choose who we spend it with. Eventually, Daniel got better, he came back home, and life went on as usual, except there was something that I realized when I was there with my brother at the hospital. Something I realized when I saw him go through rehabilitation. Something I realized when I saw him overcome the monumental challenges ahead of him, one at a time. What I began to recognize over my time at the hospital was that I had been seeing all my previous challenges from the wrong perspective. I had focused so much in on the challenges themselves that I couldn't see past beyond them. And I realized that this was why I had always wanted to run away from my challenges when I was younger, instead of facing them. Imagine this dot on the screen is a hardship or a challenge that you're facing. Right now, it doesn't seem that big, and in fact, it barely picks up any space against the white ground. But imagine what happens if you focus in on that dot. It becomes larger and larger until eventually, even that one small dot can fill up our entire view. This was how I felt about the challenges revolving around my brother's condition. Even small problems felt big, and no matter which way I looked, I couldn't find a way out because I had already focused so much into that challenge, into that black dot. What my experience at the hospital taught me was to take a step back, quite literally, and see the bigger picture. And when I did this, not only did I realize that my problems weren't as big as I thought they were, but it opened my eyes to see possibilities that were there all this time as well. So I decided to try something different. Instead of thinking about the things that Daniel couldn't do, I started thinking about the things that he could do and how I could use those things to help him overcome the challenges that he faced. I started thinking about possibility. And this is what eventually led me to start a personal project for my brother to help him in his daily life. Now the main hardship Daniel had growing up was that he couldn't use his body to carry out his daily tasks. But it dawned on me at some point that even though Daniel couldn't use his arms or his legs, he still had control over his voice, and just maybe I could use that to help him overcome his physical limitations. The idea was to use a voice recognition system that could understand Daniel's speech patterns and translate them into actions through connecting to various electronics and devices in his room, like his electric wheelchair. Now, the electric wheelchair has a central joystick that can be moved by hand to steer the wheelchair in certain directions. But imagine just for a second, if instead one could say the command, go, and the wheelchair could move in the forward's direction. For people like Daniel, who aren't able to use their hands anymore, this could be an avenue for opportunity. However, as soon as that idea came up, we ran into a roadblock because at the hospital, Daniel underwent a surgery that affected his speech. And so his words became foreign to existing voice recognition systems like Google Assistant and Amazon Alexa. So I went online and I taught myself how to program a voice recognition device for Daniel and it looked like the following workflow. I first recorded Daniel saying a bunch of words like on, go, left, right. And after amassing a sizable data set of his voice files, I trained a neural network on this data set. Now a neural network is in the field of artificial intelligence, machine learning, but you can kind of think of it as the brain. At first, it knows nothing, but as it receives data and trains on it, it begins to develop certain features and patterns that it can use to differentiate one word between another. 
To make an analogy, this is really similar to how we first learned words when we were younger. Whenever we heard a word for the first time, we probably couldn't associate it to its meaning, its pronunciation, its spelling right away. However, as we hear these words on repetition, we begin to develop a sense of intuition of why cow sounds differently than cat, why computer sounds differently than computation, why supercalifragilisticexpialidocious sounds differently than high. It's the consonants, the syllables, the phonetic structure of the word itself that helps us differentiate one word between another. Now the neural network does the exact same process. We first receive an audio file of a person saying a word. We can then transform this audio waveform into something called a spectrogram, which is just another visualization of the audio data, but with regards to its frequency. Now frequency is something that occurs in all our voices. Whenever we speak a word, it's made up of different frequencies. Some can be high pitch, some can be low pitch, but ultimately, every sound that we make is comprised of frequencies. We can then get a neural network to analyze certain patterns and features that come up in these spectrogram images, which help us differentiate one word between another. Let's take, for example, the words left and right. Even though their waveforms look similar, their spectrograms are different because the frequencies used to pronounce each word are unique and therefore differentiable. Left, for example, has a strip of intensity at the bottom center, while we see that on right, there is rather a dark spot in its center. So just by analyzing the spectrograms, we can tell the difference between what makes left left and right right. And by training a neural network with multiple samples of these left and right audio files, we can be begin to develop an intuition of why left sounds differently than right as well. It's the patterns, the features that come up in these spectrograms which allow it to make that differentiation. Then after having been trained on this data set, whenever my brother speaks a command like left or right, the neural network is able to identify what word he's spoken to a high accuracy because it already knows the general image and shape of these spectrograms. It knows what patterns it should find in the word left. It knows what features it should look for in the word right. So now we had a voice recognition system that could understand my brother's voice commands and carry them out. The next step was to integrate this onto my brother's wheelchair. And for this, I designed a mechanical device that could move the joystick for him. This was 3D printed, mounted onto the wheelchair. And then I began testing the wheelchair by driving it around in the house. At first, I didn't know what I was doing. I think at some point on the left, I ended up crashing the wheelchair. And I discovered that during my testing, wheelchairs are like mini tanks, nothing can stop them. But after putting some safety precautions in place, I asked Daniel to come back onto the wheelchair. And everything led to this one moment where Daniel was able to control the wheelchair again for the first time since his visit to the hospital. Ava? Oh. Here, Daniel issues the command Ava go Ava to activate the voice recognition system and go to move the wheelchair forwards. You'll soon say Ava S, S to stop. Ava S. Next, Daniel will say Ava L to turn left. Ava L. And don't worry, the wheelchair can turn right as well. We use L and R instead of full words because it's easier for Daniel to pronounce. I named the AI Ava after a character in our favorite movie, Wally. -E. Wally -E is about how two robots go on to bring a better future for humanity. And though back then I saw it as a heartwarming movie, with recent developments in technology, I recognize that this is a future or a possibility in our future today. There's already a lot of work being done in the field of assistive technology. And along with continuing this project for my brother and others like him, I realized my dream of wanting to work in this field, of wanting to see the possibilities that lie within. 
As I grew up beside my brother, I've been to a lot of fundraisers for muscular dystrophy, visited the hospital frequently, and met many others who have the same condition as my brother. One profound thing that I've always taken away whenever I talk to them is their bright energy and positivity for life. They're always so thankful for what they have, and they never fail to see the possibilities that lie within their own lives. And I think that's what makes them so inspirational. I truly believe that what makes a person different isn't based on their status, but it's more so based on the impact they leave on other people. And the impact that my brother's left on my life makes him a hero and a role model to me. At some point in our lives, I think we've all had that one dot that became too big, filled up our view. And who knows, that dot might come again. But I think it's important at those times to remind ourselves that our problems are only as big as we make them to be. And to remind ourselves that regardless of disability, regardless of our fears and worries, regardless of whatever situation or circumstance we might be going through, that there's always the possibility for hope. My name is Michael Coe, and thank you so much for listening to my TED